Okay, welcome everyone to GOMI, the Global Organization for Wilderness Medicine's Education Lecture Series. My name is Claire. I'm an MS2 at University of Miami and I'm the Vice Coordinator for GOMI and we're so happy to have you all here today. If you haven't already, please follow us on Twitter and Instagram and check out our website where we post about our upcoming talks as well as have our recorded lectures from previous weeks. Our mission is to create an educational platform where interested students and healthcare professionals can explore and interact with wilderness and emergency medicine and to showcase the diverse spheres in which physicians and healthcare professionals can make an impact and inspire others to think abstractly about the ways in which we can utilize our careers in healthcare and medicine and to create an international community of wilderness medicine enthusiasts and experts committing to promoting a diverse and culturally competent environment. This week, we're very excited to have extreme medicine and please check out the rest of our talks for this semester, including next week's space medicine talk. We're so excited to have Dr. Will Duffin with us today. Dr. Will Duffin is the Joint Medical Director of the World Extreme Medicine. World Extreme Medicine, formerly Expedition and Wilderness Medicine, is the world's leading provider of Expedition, Wilderness, remote medicine training and courses for medical professional, as well as international diploma in Expedition Medicine and a gold standard for the MSC program in extreme medicine. Wilderness Extreme Medicine was born out of expeditions over 25 years ago, and whilst we've changed and grown, they continue to lead the way in outstanding and insp inspirational expedition medicine training. Dr. Duffin is also involved in uh, producing and developing the extreme medicine master's program at Exeter University Medical School, the WEMCAST podcast, WEMCAST Live, Dr. Duffin is also a GP and adventure addict. He has provided medical cover for well over a dozen very diverse overseas expeditions from commercial high altitude treks and luxury private trains to working with UNICEF in Myanmar and for a reality TV show, Remote Pacific Islands. He thrives in new, newly formed teams operating in low resource and remote environments that require com camaraderie. So we'd all invite you to listen to this lecture today. Claire, thank you very much for that very warm welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, now, please use the chat box. Uh, it would be great to hear from you. Please say what, uh, what medical school you're at, what year you're in, where you're based. Uh, tell me a little bit about you. Um, I love hearing from you all, so please do, do that now. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and share some slides with you. I'm gonna talk for about 30 minutes maximum, and then it's really over to you guys for your comments and questions. So uh, really hope to, to have a, a bit of discussion uh, after this and we'll cap this whole session at an hour. Okay. So yeah, I'm, my name's Will Duffin. So I'm the medical director of World Extreme Medicine. If you haven't heard of us, then pop that into Google, World Extreme Medicine, and all the stuff we do will come up. I'm also a, a jobbing frontline uh, clinician. And over the next 30 minutes, I want to share with you a little, about, a little bit about me, where I've come from, um, what I've been involved with, and tell you more about the newest, most exciting emerging medical subspecialty, which is extreme medicine, which is something you're all very much interested in. Tell you what kind of skills are required, how you can be part of the adventure. And I'm gonna finish by telling you how an adventurous career can help you adopt something called the adventure mindset. It'll help you with all aspects of your professional and personal life. So this is me now. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a jobbing GP. Uh, I did my uh, medical school in Bristol in the UK. I graduated in 2008. I did a stint working in uh, the emergency department. I did some uh, emergency training in Australia and I came back and did my GP training as a family physician training. And at the moment, I'm a, I'm a locum GP. So I'm freelance. I, I work for different practices and that, that gives me the flexibility and availability I need to take on expedition work and, and the other kind of side projects that I've got going on that you'll hear all about. And I wasn't always into expeditions during university, uh, sorry, college for, for you guys. 
I was um, into break dancing. Actually, that was my big thing. I, I, I just spent a lot of time in nightclubs dancing. That I just loved it. But I've always been quite sporty. Uh, I love trail running. I've always loved uh, scuba diving and surfing. Um, and you know, I, I think a lot of us have, have got this vision of how do you combine a love for adventurous activities and travel with a medical career and I'm, I'm happy to report that they are very easy bedfellows uh, they really do go well so when I, I came back from Australia having done some emergency medicine I pinged out a load of emails to some expedition companies and I must have um, emailed maybe 20 or 30 and one of them came back gave me an interview nothing happened for a while and then they got a dropout uh, three weeks notice, they said, look, we've got no one to be the medic on this trek up Mount Kilimanjaro. It's pretty high. It's nearly 6,000 meters. I'd never been to an altitude like that before, but hey, it was no brainer. I said, yes. Uh, and and um, yeah, so I ended up being the medic on this, this Kilimanjaro trek. And that was a bit of a baptism of fire. Loads of medicine on, on trips like that. I saw lots of acute mountain sickness. I saw lots of dehydration, lots of um, heat stress. Uh, but came back, you know, got, got up to the summit with uh, most of the participants and I was hooked from that moment. And once you've got your foot in the door with this kind of work, it's amazing how that spawns other opportunities. So I've ended up in the Sahara Desert doing some uh, helping to lead some groups uh, there. And, and the, the main kind of condition I was treating out there was really heat, heat related illness. Crazy hot. This is out on the salt plain. This is southern Morocco. And uh, even the, the the leader, the expedition leader I was with, he got completely nailed by the heat. And I was, I was treating him and, and all the participants. No one developed heat stroke, but a lot of heat exhaustion. Uh, you've just got to be really covered up like, like this. And then I ended up in the Ant Peruvian Andes uh, doing the Inca Trail. Uh, that was really cool. Uh, again, a lot of altitude related sickness there. There's a, there's a part on the Inca Trail called Dead Woman's Pass, which is where it goes up to about 4,300 4, meters. Uh, and a lot of our trekkers got sick there. Um, so a lot of it's around managing risk, identifying where someone scores on the, on the Lake Louise score for altitude sickness and making sensible decisions as to whether you, uh, you're comfortable with them to continue to ascend, whether they need to stay at the same altitude or whether you need to send them down. So it's a lot of decision making. It's really interesting medicine. Uh, and I did a similar role up at Everest Base Camp. Uh, these are these amazing bridges. They're like these little threads going across these huge uh, um, gorges that, that carve their way through the Kumbu Valley in, in the Himalayas. It's just a, a phenomenal place. And we made our way up to the, uh, the Icefall uh, Everest Base Camp. Uh, yeah, that's another amazing experience. So that's the kind of commercial trekking sector. Uh, always looking for doctors. Great, uh, great way to cut your teeth and learn some uh, some extreme medicine skills. And then the other sector I've worked in is the TV and film industry. Um, so the kind of coolest thing I did, I suppose, was working out in uh, Fiji for Survivor, uh, which I believe is very popular TV show down your way uh, in the US. Um, and this is our team. Uh, so World Extreme Medicine, we had a, we had a whole team out there. So three docs. Uh, and, and paramedics and, and nurses as a medical team of eight looking after 300 uh, strong crew, uh, about 200 of which were local Fijians, 100 were international crew from the US, Canada, Australia, the UK, etc. And we had access to this speedboat. So a lot of it was uh, we had a little clinic on the island and I saw a huge range of different things from uh, reef cuts. I did lots of suturing out there. Uh, saw quite severe head injury. Uh, so we needed to use this, this, this kit here and had to evacuate someone back to the mainland on the, on the speedboat. We had access to a helicopter, which was used for filming, but could be repurposed uh, for uh, medical evacuation as well. So that was just another really cool and very different experience. And what I'm doing here is just showcasing this diversity of different opportunities that are out there. This is a completely different again. Uh, instead of sleeping in a tent this time, I ended up in a, a luxury, uh, this is a, the Golden Eagle, the private train that, that goes between Vladivostok and Moscow across Siberia in, in Russia. Uh, and this was really cool. This was really kind of high-end stuff. So 
the uh, these the paying guests were paying um, you know, fifty thousand US dollars for a ticket, and uh, they were average age of sixty five. So a quite a departure from your your usual kind of young fit trekking crowd. Uh, lots of medical need actually, lots of chronic conditions that that, that needed managing, uh, and some of them were pretty sick. You know, some of these guys are, you know, they're quite very elderly, and they really don't mind if they die on that train. They, they, they're not bothered, but yeah, that is a problem for me having to look after them medically. <laughs> so, uh, good preparation for this, and 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 health screening was was really key. And we had a few, you know, I had a, a case of suspected stroke. I was tucking into some champagne and caviar one evening. You've got to uh, get, get into the swing of things. And uh, the, the um, train manager ran down the train and said, uh, well, we've got a guy who's had a, he's keeled over. We think he's had a stroke. And I had to kind of run down the train and send someone to get my medical kit. And uh, I, I think it, I, I, I checked him out. He hadn't had a stroke. I think he just had a bit too much to drink. Uh, so that was a... That was all right, but you you just get these kind of little little crises that can just um, emerge when you're least expecting it. And a great example of that was when I was out in Madagascar. This was a trekking uh, challenge. I was having I was we got to this uh, two thousand meter high plateau in this uh, in Andringitra National Park. It's beautiful, um, kind of high plain uh, with low forest. And I was just sitting in my tent when we got into camp. And uh, I heard all this commotion outside. I opened, unzipped the tent and poked my head out. And, and there was just th this, I, this is what I saw, this just wall of fire. And it was a, a wildfire that just came out of nowhere. And <laughs> we had to, uh, we tried to evacuate camp, realized that this thing was miles wide. We're never going to outflank it. So we <laughs> aborted, came back to camp and ended up making, with, with the porters, the porters were instrumental in getting us out of, of uh, trouble here. They um created this fire break uh so by burning a strip of uh, of bush in front of the camp it stopped the flames from leaping across so we managed to survive this through creating this this kind of fire break it all happened very very quickly and when the fire came there was just smoke and chaos uh and in the in the wake of this when the fire had passed over us we uh, i was treating burns and uh, ankle injuries and the porters who've been running through the bush trying to do this fire break so it's just amazing how it, how dynamic these environments are and then a con another completely different project that i've done just to uh, show how how varied this kind of work is was and this was in, in probably the most rewarding thing i've done my wife and i went out to myanmar uh on a unicef funded project for six months we were placed in a town where we're the, we're the only non-burmese people in this town and we were uh helping to teach um newborn my wife's pediatrician so we, we taught some emergency and newborn uh, uh resuscitation and we did some capacity building work and just knowledge sharing really with the local burmese doctors and some amazing cultural exchanges. When you're immersed in a culture for six months, you really get to know the local community, you get to learn some language, you get to learn how to tie a longi. And it's very different to being parachuted into a country in this a commercial trekking travel industry where you're really just very much this fleeting visit. You really get to immerse yourself in, in that place. Um, so again, that's a very different experience, but it's all extreme medicine. And nowadays, actually, the last couple of years, I've spent a lot of time dadding. So this is the next uh, next season, the next phase. Uh, and it actually travels a lot more tricky when you become a parent. So my top tip would be get out there while you can, pandemic permitting, of, of course, get out there while you can. Uh, because when you start having things like a house and mortgage and you know, a, a family, it, it, it's still doable, but it, it just it's not quite as easy as it once was. So uh, I'm just one example, really. I'm just a member of a large global movement that is extreme medicine, which you guys are all part of. Uh, you know, we are people that are bucking convention. We're rule takers, risk breakers and pioneers. And some of my uh, friends and colleagues uh, that are you know, cut from the same cloth, really, are, are people like Josie, uh, who's a qualified nurse. She's delivered medical care in the refugee camps of Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh and Bentu in, in South Sudan. 
Mike Barrett, he's a, he's a US physician. He regularly features in our conference and he's specialized in aerospace medicine. He's been the flight physician on two missions into space. That's pretty cool. And then Sarah Spellsberg. So I, we had her on the podcast recently. So uh, she's a, a US uh, emergency medicine physician's assistant. She works out in the Aleutian Islands, the Bering Sea, and uh, she does this uh, amazing uh, remote rural medicine evacuating people by fixed wing and, and helicopters and it's really high octane stuff and then another example is dr glenn singleman he's an australian emergency medicine physician uh good friends with with us who uh he's been the medic for james cameron's exploration of the marianas trench the deepest part of the ocean and he's also a world record holding high altitude skydiver and base jumper I, who knew that you could be a doctor and all of those things? It, well, it is, it's possible. And um, these, these are our friends, Gareth and Richard. So these are two British, uh, uh, so one's an anaesthetist and one's an ED doc. And they're just about to set out on the world's first unsupported ski crossing of Antarctica. We had these guys on a live session uh, with the World Extreme Medicine uh, recently. And uh, it's just great to see this is the kind of current crop of extreme medics who are doctors and also intrepid explorers uh, but we you know we were all standing on the shoulders of the giants that came before us so extreme medicine is not a new phenomenon and i think if i could pick just one example of a historical figure who embodies what it means to be an extreme medic it would be this guy this is Leonid Rogozov. So he's a Soviet general practitioner and he was part of the Soviet Antarctic expedition back in 1961. I'm sure some of you will have heard this story, but it's amazing. He developed, he's the only doctor on the station. He developed appendicitis. And his only salvation was to perform an appendicectomy on himself, an auto appendicectomy, the, one of the only cases of self-surgery ever performed. And this was in a remote Russian base in Antarctica. And he used this intricate system of mirrors infiltrating local anesthetic. He kept passing out because <laughs> just the general overwhelm of it all. And they had to, to, to uh, splash him with cold water to wake him up. But he succeeded. Uh, and he saved his own life. And uh, that is an extreme medicine. I don't know what is. Anyway, all these people, these medical mavericks, if you like, uh, we all get together every year in Edinburgh in the UK. Uh, it's been going on for 10 years. We have this big conference. It's a great little gathering. Get involved if, if you're interested. Uh, you can, if you just Google World Extreme Medicine Conference, you can find it. But the next event is this November in Edinburgh. So, uh, yeah, do have a look at that. It's going to be really, really good. We've got some just all of those kind of characters all coming together and sharing their their insights and their stories. So let me tell you a little bit about what ex extreme medicine is. So it's uh, it's an emerging medical subspecialty in its own right. It's been recognized in print in, this, in The Lancet. This is a publication from from 2016. Uh, and it, this is absolutely correct. It, it addresses the spirit of adventure and exploration. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Tim Nutbeam, um, who works in the same city as me as Plymouth, he describes it as the interesting bit of medicine. And I think there's a real need for extreme medicine in, in the current climate of healthcare. So I'm sure you can relate to this in the US, but certainly where I work in the NHS, there's a, a epidemic of burnout. There's uh, clinicians who are facing uh, a climate of increased uh, uh, litigation, of scrutiny on their professional practice, and at the same time having very, um, very prescribed career pathways with a huge amount of um, uh, uh, under-resourcing uh, and uh, overwork uh, going on. And, and, and a lot of them are really struggling in their careers. They reached their mid-career and, and they think about leaving medicine or, uh, altogether. So uh, extreme medicine really offers uh, its practitioners the opportunity to practice the kind of medicine perhaps they dreamed about doing at the outset of their careers. Uh, and in a sense, it's free from a lot of the bureaucracy of 
conventional clinical ward based clinic based practice. That I think that is really its, its big appeal. And I think we're all we're all built to it to adventure in some way. It's 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 ingrained in our DNA as as people. And the, for me, the, my biggest fear really is is this idea that I get to the end of my career feeling like I haven't really lived or haven't really experienced anything. Um, so yes, it, it it is risky business, but the bigger risk for me is having not lived, if if that makes sense. So what's the skill set then for, for being an extreme medic? For, for those of you who are aspirants who, are, who want to get involved with this, um, you do need your technical medical skills. So most practitioners of medicine in extreme environments will have done them, finished their medical training. They'll have done their basic foundation training in the UK or uh, you'll have your kind of basic um, internship uh, squared away you do need to be able to operate relatively independently um, so you, you need that kind of a certain level I think to be proficient but the medical skills are only a small part they're the, the the outer ring of this onion then you need of course expedition skills you need to be able to handle yourself in that environment um, and a lot of that is you, if you're on an expedition, you're part of the team, you know, you're going to help set up the tents, you might help get the uh, meals on the go, you might help administer uh, the, the rooming lists of, of your participants. And, you know, you're just kind of getting stuck in. And you've got to make sure that you can care for yourself that you, you're not going to become exposed to the heat to the to the cold to get dehydrated. You, you've got to, your level, your game has to be really high so that you always have that reserve to take on the, the needs of others. So you need those two things, but the biggest, the real core of your ability to be effective is this central portion. They're called soft skills, but I think I prefer the term non-technical skills, and that's all this stuff. So it's things like the ability to problem solve, to work under pressure, that work ethic, that's that, that um, ability to just get stuck in with, with the exhibition as a whole. Uh, and, and uh, you know, roll your sleeves up and, and, and uh, be a useful general team member to be able to improvise. You know, you have to find functional, not ideal solutions to, to problems. You didn't always have all the kit or the imaging or bloods that you might normally have. You have to be adaptable and you have to be resilient. So these are all the, the skills and attributes that you're going to need if you want to go down this route. And the, the human factors component of any expedition is huge it really is the the thing that can make or break any team human facts is something we're particularly interested in at world extreme medicine so we're, we're developing lots of training materials um, on this and this is really an understanding of how people perform under pressure and in the dynamics of a, of a team that's working under stress uh, and uh, you know a, a key um a key feature of this kind of work is that, as I said before, with that experience in Madagascar, the forest fire, and then this guy having a suspected stroke on this, the train, you know, there's been loads of other examples of, of things like that, where things have just suddenly gone. You know, I, was, I was with a group in the Pyrenees and, and just a, a trekker just fell off an edge, just, just gone. <laughs> there's someone screaming for me. Um, they were fine, luckily, um, slid down the, the rock face like a cat. <laughs> but it can go wrong when you least expect it. Um, so even with the best, most planning and, uh, and preparation, you always have to be prepared to adapt and adjust in the moment. And this is, a, this is one example uh, of a real expedition. Imagine you're the medic and everything's going great. This is the, uh, the, uh, this is the Arctic and this machine is clearing a runway. And then that suddenly happens just Think for a moment, if, if you were there on the ice, how, what would you do? How would you respond? You know, has anything in your medical training prepared you to manage something like that, to be part of that, the response to that situation? You know, you've got to, you've got to retrieve uh, that poor uh, driver from a deep crevasse in the Arctic. Just, to, just imagine what that would be like. So it is a great ticket to ride, but it also comes with huge responsibility. Uh, so you need to be able to, to step up to the plate. And the, the, the operating environment looks very different, of course. So um, as I said before, you don't have your access to normal diagnostics. 
this is a kind of typical field setup. Let's say you're just dressing a wound. Um, you know, all your kit will be in dry bags or in Tupperwares and you'll be kind of pulling out. You'll be working on the on the floor of a forest or a desert or, or you know you've got to be able to just kind of set up shop anywhere really I've, I've done a lot of clinics out of hotel rooms in different parts of the world and uh, so you just have to be quite adaptable and just able to to kind of to make it work for you and then if you do more humanitarian type work there's even if you do get to a medical facility they often look something like this you know, where I was working out in Myanmar this was the state of the operating rooms um you can see just how unsanitary it is how basic the equipment is um so this is where you need to be able to really just do the best with what you've got and accept that you you know you can't provide the same standard of care that you might like to back home and i think the biggest realization for me so transitioning from that interest in adventure and travel into combining that in with a medical career is that the moment you realize that wherever there is endeavor, wherever there's adventure and exploration, wherever humankind goes, they're going to need a medic. And that could be you. And that is an amazingly empowering thing to realize that your medical qualifications are an amazing passport to some amazing experiences. And extreme medicine, really, I, I, I've used that term, but I haven't really qualified what it is. It's really the amalgamation of all of this stuff. So, yes, it's expedition and wilderness medicine. I suppose that's the, the main thing that I've done. But it's it's everything. It's it's space and aviation. It's the, the humanitarian uh, uh, work. It's pre-hospital care. It's military and, and tactical. It's um, diving medicine. Uh, it's it, you know very much in the same vein as what uh, at uh, Gomi that you're trying to achieve by bringing all of these diverse fields together uh, because there's so much uh, learning that can be shared between these different silos and certainly historically when I first got involved all of these uh, different fields were very much in isolation and I think the the work that that you're doing at Gomi and we're doing at WEM is really about joining up those different areas and sharing the learning uh, between us and i really liked your gomi mission statement that's brilliant we've got one at when uh, and this is what it looks like so we're the we see ourselves really as as it's just the champions really of this global movement um, that involves all of you guys here um, you know we just want to to promote this uh a different way of approaching your medical career and how invigorating that can be for both you professionally and, and the value you can add in, in different corners of the globe. So we're just here to, we, we, we seek to amplify the, the learning and the benefits of, uh, and, and fly the flag really for everyone that is uh, doing this interesting work. Uh, and we also want to, to widen the appeal and broaden access, recognizing that there's a diversity crisis, certainly in the expedition medicine world, uh, a lot of uh, the, I think, senior figures are older white blokes with beards, uh, not necessarily beards, um, but who've uh, maybe from a certain social set. And, uh, you know, we want to, we want more um, ethnic minorities, we want more women, and we want more non-Western um, countries to engage with this. And, yeah, we we're getting some really good traction in places like India, in the Middle East, um, uh, and, and, and it's really nice to see that there's exactly what's happening in the US and the UK with wilderness medicine is, is being replicated. It's, it's, it's already in existence in these other countries. It's just connecting all of those dots uh, together. So when we also run loads of really cool courses, um, so this is our dive medicine course in Florida at the Aquarius Reef Base, which is the a big uh, analog uh, for the astronauts. They, they, they train down there. Uh, and uh, I suppose the last, we, you know, we, we do uh, courses in, in polar, alpine, desert, you know, pretty much every environment. Uh, I was out teaching on, on the jungle medicine co course most recently. This is in Costa Rica. And this is what our classroom looks like. I mean, what a great place to learn. And we have a little jungle camp. It rained just relentlessly. 
<laughs> you know, making fire as a challenge. But, uh, you know, we do lots of, uh, of teaching and we have fun. We, we This is some stretcher carry racing um, that, that we did and did some rafting. I mean, it just it's just great fun just to be on these courses. So definitely get involved uh, on a course. It doesn't have to be ours. There's lots of other people that are doing um, really good wilderness medicine courses. I think that's a really great uh, stepping point, uh, entry point for, for this world. And uh, I'd be remiss of me to say that the world has changed recently. In fact, a lot of our courses have been on hold because of the travel restrictions with, with COVID. So we've been doing a lot more digital. Um, so we've been doing lots of podcasts and, and live sessions and things, um, which has been a whole adventure of its own. Um, and I've met loads of really interesting people. Our conference last year was completely online. So, you know, that's a whole new learning curve for all of us. Uh, but we do have a great podcast. It's called Wemcast. And we've got quite a few. Uh, we've got an American and Canadian host uh, who contribute to that. Um, so there's some really good guests on that. Do check that out if you get a chance. And we've got something called the Wem Academy, which is this Netflix style uh, online learning platform with loads of extreme medicine, CPD and, um, and content and stuff on there. And the other thing we've been working on is this fellowship, which is a a way of, of kind of recognizing and standardizing certain competencies within extreme and wilderness medicine. Uh, so we really just tried to set a benchmark um, to so that people can have some kind of way of credentializing their experience uh, and their competencies. So that was a big bit of work we've been doing recently. And then the other thing, um, so as I said, the expedition medicine work has dried up. So I've been mostly involved recently with the film industry, with uh, COVID mitigation, talk about adaptability. So we've been working with, um, uh, with uh, Paramount Pictures. We've been working with Tom Cruise. Uh, we're doing Transformers, uh, Jack Ryan, um, and quite a few other productions where we've sent um, clinicians, mostly paramedics, uh, onto the set, uh, supported by myself and my colleague, um, to to essentially uh, ensure the safe set protocols are happening so people are washing their hands and wearing masks and we run all of the PCR testing that enables these productions to continue. So that's been another massive learning curve but goes to show you just never really know even in a pandemic where all this stuff is going to take you just kind of kind of go with it. Okay so uh, let's move on now to something called the adventure mindset. And I wanted to finish my bit of talking before I open it up for, for questions with uh, just a, a concept, which I, I've personally found very helpful. And yes, you can physically go on adventures. Uh, and, and that's really the, that, that's certainly my big drive with being involved with a lot of this work is it, is it takes me to wild places and, 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 exposes me to experiences that enable me to grow as a person but adventure is it's not outside of man it's within and even when you're not actively adventuring even when you're grounded uh, or you're studying for exams um, or you're in the middle of a global pandemic you can still embody the spirit of adventure in everything you do in day-to-day -day life and uh, this is just five things I want to share with you. These are five, five things that being involved in adventurous travel and medical work has given me that I've taken into my day-to-day -day life back home. Um, and the first thing really is, is treating every day like a mini expedition. So I'm freelance, I'm a locum GP. And for many people, that's quite unsettling. You turn up at different practices. Uh, it can be quite exhausting. You never really get settled in. You never really get to know everyone. But for me, with, with an adventure mindset, it, each one of those is their, its own little expedition, its own little, its own little challenge. Um, I, I enjoy the variety, the diversity, the, the lack of routine. Um, so it's just a simple mind check, mindset shift that enables me to approach that with, these, with, with this very kind of positive frame of mind. In medical practice, I think we run the risk of becoming very task focused. I think we easily uh, can over medicalize. We, we, patients can become these kind of scientific objects. We, we, we can lack empathy and become disconnected. And I think you can, if you, if you have this adventure mindset, you're able to see, appreciate beauty more. And the 
there's huge beauty in the landscapes uh, of the different places you can visit in physical terms, but there's also immense beauty in the person that is sat in front of you that you're consulting with. And you just have to open your eyes to it. And I think if you're, if you're, if you have the adventure mindset, you can access that much more readily. So that's seeing the beauty in people in just the same way you, 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 you'd see the beauty in that in the landscape. The next thing is embracing uncertainty. And medicine is, is really riddled with uncertainty. I mean, it's, uh, it can be the most challenging part of the job, uh, working with limited information, not really knowing whether you've got the right diagnosis, uh, and what, what, whether that patient's going to represent with uh, you know, the worst case scenario. And holding that risk, it can be very anxiety provoking, I think, for a lot of clinicians. But I think extreme medicine, wilderness medicine, it prepares you to deal with uncertainty, to embrace that and 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 recognize that that's part of the free song. It's part of what makes medicine such a rewarding and um, fascinating, endlessly fascinating profession. The next thing is courage. And I think there's, there's been a real shift towards fear-based medicine um, in the last few years, maybe the litigation culture. And certainly in the UK, we have huge amount of scrutiny on our work. And working in wilderness and extreme medicine it helps you to become courageous to you have to work independently you have to back your decision you have to go with it and and um and, and, and own that decision uh, and make it the right decision and i think that really helps people to practice with uh courage uh rather than fear um and, and you know being able to deviate from guidelines being able to to move away from just basic evidence-based medicine to a more nuanced evidence-informed practice. And the final mindset shift as part of this adventure mindset that I'm going to share with you is this, this idea of being able to follow your heart. And uh, medical training can be very much this linear hoop jumping, box ticking exercise. There's a, there's a path neatly laid out for all of us in our careers. And maybe that's the right path for you. I, I'm, not, I'm not here to, to say, but I think what being involved with adventure and expeditions does is it helps you to break free of that invisible script and really ask yourself and identify what makes your heart sing and to be able to follow that. Uh, and be a free spirit to to break convention and 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 have a, a unique career that is uh, fulfilling and true to who you are you know you'll be a, a following your own authentic path um you have to seize the opportunities you know life is short um so i think this is a great a great outlet for for anyone that that has the slightest desire to be a bit more of a free spirit and not just follow the herd so there you go. That is extreme medicine. Uh, that is how to be a practitioner, what the skills are um, and the, the adventure mindset uh, and what that has done for me uh, in my career. Uh, and as you can see, I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm loving being a doctor. I'm, I'm loving um, the, the amazing opportunities it's given me. And I, I really hope that you, know, you can find your own path within this really exciting field as well. Please reach out to me anytime. I'm will at extreme-medicine.com and Google World Extreme Medicine. You can learn more about everything that, that we do with that. Uh, big thank you to, uh, to Shilpi, Catherine, Claire and Katrina for having me to speak and all the great work that you're doing with GoMe. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll hand back to you, Claire, and I'll be open for some questions. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, awesome lecture and wonderful life lessons at the end. Thanks for sharing those amazing resources. I'm going to have Katrina take over the Q&A. I would really appreciate if you guys turn on some of your cameras just to make this a little more interactive. Thank you, Claire. Um, so, and thank you, Dr. Duffin, for that amazing lecture. Um, so for our first question, we had, um, how do you manage taking time off to work on ex expeditions? It seems like it would be hard to ask your hospital slash practice for time off so often. 
Do you talk to your employer in advance? Do you take short locum jobs, et cetera? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Now, what's really interesting, I think in the US, your work culture is slightly different in the UK. Your, the amount of annual leave that you guys have is, um, is not, what, what, what is it nowadays? Katrina, tell me. Um, I guess it's largely dependent on what kind of specialty you go into yeah. and whether it's private practice or not. Sure. Um, there's a lot of actual factors um, okay, for so physician schedules, schedules. Yeah. Sure. My understanding was that it's not that much. And I think if you're in a full-time post, a lot of medical specialties, it can be quite restrictive and negotiating leave from rot from fixed rotors, for example, is particularly tricky. Um, it, this is a tricky one. I mean, you need to get your training done. So there may be a period where you just got to take the hit, get, get through your training, but um, if you can choose a specialty which offers a bit more flexibility um, and, and whether you can negotiate some time out of program, then that's a great way to get some experience under your belt. I mean, this is this is the perennial problem, really, is a lot of these opportunities require availability at relatively short notice and quite prolonged periods. So often, you know, two weeks, three weeks, you know, a couple of months sometimes. So some of the really interesting film projects they've wanted, I was going to go and work with a TV crew in Vietnam uh, and they wanted a month of my time with three weeks notice. I, you know, how many people can offer that? Very few. So it, this is, it, there, I don't have any solutions to that, but it's definitely a, a huge rate limiting step in what you're able to engage with. And actually it's the reason now that I'm fully trained, I've done my, completed my training. I'm, I, I'm self, I'm freelance. That, that's kind of why I've, I've done that. I haven't, I'm not joined officially with a practice. I, I can just take on work and, and, and build work in around projects. So um, that's working for me at the moment, but I fully appreciate when you're going through the training grades, you're, you might need to just take the hit and um, just get through it, get it under your belt. Thank you for answering that one. Our next one is um, how do you go about finding these various opportunities? I think the biggest, the biggest thing is being proactive. They're not going to come to you. These are, uh, these are unusual opportunities. Uh, and I think the first question is, is asking yourself which aspect of extreme medicine appeals to you? Do you want to be working for Medicine Sans Frontier? Do you want to be going out into the Congo and, and helping some, you know, some of the, 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 the neediest uh, refugees and, you know, war-torn areas? Is that, is that really what, what makes you tick? Or do you want to be working more with the kind of commercial trekking sector like I have? Or do you want to be doing TV and film? Do you want to be getting into space and aviation? So definitely do your research and think, you know, which, which area do I want to, to, to focus on? And then find out, find the people that are doing that work already, LinkedIn or other, other, other me mechanisms, and, and send them a message. What really helps, a really powerful tool is a mentor, just someone that can just point you in the right direction. So reach out to them. And honestly, people love being approached. It's very gratifying for them. If you, if you say, hey, I'm a medical student, I'm really interested in, I love the work that you're doing. I, I'd like to explore this myself. You know, what do you suggest? What courses could I do? Any of the any organizations I could get some internships with, et cetera. So find a mentor. Uh, and once you've got the right kind of training under your belt and you feel you can practice more independently, then you just need to, like I did with the expedition stuff, I just emailed like 20 or 30 companies. I just Googled them. You, you can find everything on Google. Find organizations that you want to be involved with, send them an email or, or find their number, ring the office and say, can I talk to your operations manager and just pitch, just pitch to them and just say, hey, look, this is who I am. Do you, know, do you think there could be a role for me? You've just got to put yourself, you've got to put it out there. And, um, and then eventually it's a numbers game. Uh, eventually you'll, you know, some opportunities will and some doors will open. And, and, and once you're in, that opens more opportunity. So just getting that first gig is probably the hardest bit, but it really comes from being proactive. Thank you. I think that's some great advice. Our next question was, is a, a certain specialty slash preferred or demand uh, to pursue in this type of career? Uh, I, I personally think that generalist specialties are best suited um, because when you're the lone medic on a trip, you have to turn your hand to pretty much everything from Hobbs and Guiney um, to um, 
uh, you know, you might be doing a bit of pediatrics, you might be doing a bit of uh, dermatology, you know, you, you, you really have to be a jack of all trades. So I think being a generalist, and for me, I think emergency uh, medicine is a really good place, uh, as is family physicians, uh, or just general internal medicine. Uh, but that's, it's not a barrier if you do have a specialty. I, I know loads of even ophthalmologists and pathologists who've done this work. So it's, it's not, um, everyone has something different to, to bring into the mix, everyone's different uh, skills and things. So, but if you can go, if you can get a broad base, a broad skill set, that will be, uh, make you most useful on an expedition or in you know, extreme medicine as a whole. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question was, what have you learned from native citizens and medic and medics during your travels? Oh, wow. Yeah, so much. I think the um, so the the Sherpas, for example, in, in Nepal, uh, just seeing how they just learning how they thrive in, in, at altitude in the mountains. Uh, and, you know, it's always this horrible juxtaposition between all the Western uh travelers you know we've got all this expensive kit um and it's all new and shiny and they really just got the hand-me-downs some trekkers that have given their stuff in at the end of their trip so you know they don't have a lot but just seeing how they they thrive in, in that environment and um how they how they handle themselves um uh you know, yeah there's a huge amount you can learn from from the local people and the, 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 lo the local porters in Madagascar were really the, our salvation in that forest fire. Without them, we would have uncertain, there's no doubt in my mind we would have died, all of us. Um, so I think it's really important to uh, acknowledge their, their contribution to the, to the expedition. And, um, and yeah, it's a huge amount we can learn from them. Uh, just thinking about the, um, the, the best bit, uh, the, the thing I remember from the, 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 the local team of the porters and 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 um the team in in tanzania was their music uh, the, every time we stopped they just do all this singing and dancing and they get everyone up and um that was amazing uh yeah really kind of created this incredible atmosphere um so yeah they they, they really make the exhibition happen uh that the the kind of locals um definitely uh a key part of of the whole operation Thank you. Um, the next question was, how, if possible, do you balance personal life and ex expeditions? Um, what has your experience looked like? How to balance your personal and professional life with expeditions? Um, yes, I think this is a yeah, really key question. It really depends on, um, I think, your stage in your career. I, I, the way I see it, there's this, this kind of zenith in your career where you've got the training and experience um to be effective and useful but you're not too far down where you've as i said before you've got a family and you've got mortgage and you've got maybe dependent elderly grandparents you know you've got all these kind of other factors so i think there's a window of maybe five to ten years in your professional career where you will be at the peak of your availability where you you know it taking these trips doesn't impinge too much on your personal life um so I, I think it's recognizing when that window is and really making the most of, of that and, and getting as much under your belt uh, during that period. But it is, it's, it's important to get the right balance. Um, everything in life is, is about balance. So um, it depends on your individual circumstances, but, but I, I'd be, um, be, be aware that if you really want to go down this route that it can involve a lot of time overseas a lot of a lot of travel being away from loved ones you know I, I've missed lots of birthdays and um, family events um, and your know, friends getting married because uh, I've been away um, so there are sacrifice there that is the big sacrifice I think um, so you, you just have to decide whether you're comfortable with that Thank you for your candor with that answer. Um, our next question was, um, what has been your most difficult case in the field so far? Oh, I think you know, the, the cases I found most difficult aren't necessarily because the medicine is complex. It really is that it's actually generally pretty cut and dry. It's is how sick is this person? Can I, can I deal with this right now? 
or uh, is, are we in real trouble? You know, do we need to evacuate them uh, and, and get definitive care? That's really the decision tree. It's binary in my view. But the biggest complicating factor in that is what state you're in. And I think probably the hardest time, the hardest situation I had was when I, yeah, Everest Base Camp, when we got to the highest, one of the highest parts of that trek. This was day 12, I think, day 11 or day 12. And uh, we came in, it's been a really long, it's like um, uh, kind of 13, 14 hour day of trekking, uh, gaining altitude. And, um, uh, you know, you came into the tea house and I was just, you know, it's what it was, I'm pretty, I'm really good at altitude. I generally acclimatize quite well. I'm a fast acclimatizer, but for some reason that day, I just hadn't got my hydration right. I hadn't really, I hadn't been eating enough. My self-care had fallen by the wayside, if I'm honest. And I was struggling. I, I was, uh, I wasn't ill, but I was really, really tired and a headache. I just wanted to sit down. We, we got into the tea house and everyone needs you you know that i had six people who all had medical issues all relatively minor primary care type stuff someone had a sore throat a headache um there's a bit of altitude sickness uh and i just wanted to just lie in my sleeping bag and just go into a ball and i think that's probably the moment where i was you know you really have to dig deep uh and and you have to you know sit down with those people you know give them good quality care even though you're feeling really awful yourself um, and I think a lot of other expedition medics can relate to that. You know, there are, there'll be times where you're just really tired and it's oh, another example is when the middle of the night where someone just got this ex horrible explosive diarrhea and got really dehydrated and I was having to give them IM, um, antiemetics and stuff. And it was, it was just this really grim bunk house and there was, there was just shit everywhere. And, uh, I was <laughs> the middle of the night and you're just thinking, oh, this is rubbish <laughs> and it's not sexy medicine. Um, so it was really just, you know, looking after this individual, um, tr trying to help them stop vomiting so they didn't get de too dehydrated and, and their altitude sickness get worse. Um, but yeah, those are the, the kind of dark moments, I suppose. Yeah, thank you for that as well. Um, I had another question about how does the Extreme Medicine Fellowship that your organization recently started differ from the FAWM or the Fellowship Academy? Wilderness Medicine by the Wilderness Medical Society. Yeah, good question. Good question. So um, I think the FEWM is primarily aimed at wilderness medicine uh, and for doctors. Um, so it's all based, uh, aimed for clinicians. So what we've designed is slightly different in that it covers the full breadth of extreme medicine that I mentioned. Um, so whether you're doing humanitarian work or space or tactical or, you know, so it's, it's the full gamut. It's also non-clinicians as well. So it, it extends to um, expedition leaders and operations managers and rope technicians, you know, anyone that's involved in supporting that the medicine in, in that area. Um, and I think we've we wanted to create something that was um, that was a bit more inclusive where um that there wasn't just the, you know, to be a member, you have to reach certain uh, level of competency and experience, but there's also, uh, sorry, to be a fellow, you have to, to do that, but there was also a membership option as well. And I think that's a great, a great option for um, students who are aspiring to do this kind of work, but aren't quite there yet. So it's a great way where you, you can get involved and you get all the benefits. Um, you don't get the letters after your name that you didn't be, become a fellow, but, you know, you can still be involved in the, the social and, and all the other the side of, uh, of of being part of that. So that, that that they're the main differences between the fellowship that we've launched and the the uh, um, fellowship that that's run by the um, WMS. That's great. Thank you. I think we have time for just a few more. Um, I don't want to hold anyone over time. So um, the next question was. What is your advice for someone who loves extreme medicine but has a terrible phobia for reptiles or certain allergy towards reptiles? <laughs> Just avoid going to environments where there are lots of reptiles. I thought the polo would be good for you. Not many reptiles going on there. Space, space medicine. Don't go to the desert or the jungle. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I reckon that is unless it's a a really bad phobia. I reckon that's something you could overcome. You could work on that. I'm sure that wouldn't be a barrier if, if you really, um, uh, you know, had, did some deeper inner work and really asked yourself, you know, am I really, 
um afraid I, I, I actually you mentioned there's a, a severe, severe allergy that's less easy to reverse um but yeah pick your environments carefully awesome thank you uh i'll just do two more if that's okay with you um how do you navigate language barriers during emergency situations yeah I, I, language is if for those of you that um are going to do lots of traveling i think if there's one way of connecting with local people and, and fast tracking your working relationship, it's learning just some of the basic language uh, and it's, and it's fun and it's a cultural exchange. It's, it's definitely something I'd recommend. And if you're ever going for any prolonged period anywhere, start learning language at least two months before you leave um, to, before you go into the country. Um, and there's some great language resources, apps and things out there. And it, it just really, you'll have more enjoyable experience and that if you can learn some medical um, language that that can really help so just base simple basic words will go a long way um i mean in the parts of the world i've i've worked um you can never really get working proficiency in the medical language in that country uh so i'm just thinking if there's like indonesia and so i did learn some bahasa and and i'd learned some burmese when i was out in, in myanmar but you know i I had such a basic level, I, I couldn't really, you know, I couldn't fully overcome the, the language barrier. But fortunately, uh, a lot of these countries, the doctors, interestingly, all speak English because they're educated class. So if you're communicating with other, other doctors, they generally speak English, most of the parts of the world. People, uh, so and, and people in the nursing profession or um, you know, healthcare assistants, that often they tend to only speak the local language. But you'd be amazed at how many... Uh, doctors specifically in these parts of the world and it's part of being the global elite I suppose you know we're all beneficiaries of you know education um, uh, you know, you, you're generally communicating in English uh, or you've at the very least you'll have uh, some kind of interpreter with you but do learn some of the local language that can be it can be helpful but usually you know you, you, you can have you can use English in most of these situations. Thank you. And one last question was, what are some of your future plans for uh, world extreme medicine? And do you have any expeditions or places you would like to visit in the near future? Oh, there is so many places I'm sure we'd all like to visit. It's, uh, it's all a bit uncertain at the moment. Um, uh, and it's certainly I would to be completely candid, the actual kind of whole expedition world is a, still very much in stasis. I think it's, um, you know, the, the parts of the world that these 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 um, expeditions run in are you know, unlike uh, you know we're, we're very fortunate in the US and the UK that we've had very high vaccination rates and you know we're, we're returning to some semblance of, of normality but yeah you know, other parts of the, the globe are you know not not where we are and I think their COVID rates are very high and, and travel is very difficult still so uh, I don't really have any fixed plans at the moment or anything you know, concrete that that's lined up. Um, I was signed up to do an adventure race um, in Patagonia, um, which was was going to be really good. That you know, it's non medical, but it was a uh, it's a five day race called the Eco Challenge, uh, which was on Amazon Prime uh, the last se season. So we, we, a team, uh, I was in the team that was going to do that. That's been canned. In fact, <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. Pretty much everything I've planned has been cancelled, um, and I'm sure you can all relate to this. So I think the next big thing with WEM really is we've got this conference in November. We're really looking forward to that, growing that and, and, and building the community and the movement. Uh, and you know, it's something that a movement which you're all part of. Um, and it's just really exciting to see all the energy here and all the enthusiasm. Um, and um, uh, yeah, that's that's the plan really is just to, to grow the movement and uh, get our courses going again and um, see where see where things go, COVID permitting. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Duffin, for joining us today. And thank you everyone else for attending our lecture today. It was great having everyone. It was a great lecture. And we look forward to seeing everyone next week for space medicine. Thanks everyone. Stay extreme. <laughs>